Have you ever felt unqualified for something like the task at hand or the calling ahead of you or the responsibility you have is just beyond you, right? Every parent should be nodding their head right now. You remember that moment where you bring that first precious little baby home from the hospital? I was in Spokane, Washington. We had just given birth to, I said we had given birth. My wife gave birth. I was there holding her hand, but we had just brought our our little baby girl, Ember, into the world. And I remember looking and just at this adorable little creature and my father heart was so big towards her, but I was so enamored or uh, overwhelmed rather by by the weight of my inadequacy. Like, I can't do this. Be a father leader to Jesus. How am I gonna do this, God? And I remember watching as the doctors and nurses, they just knew everything to do with a baby, how to hold it, support its head, how to clean it, how to talk to it, how to care for it. And I remember looking at them thinking they have education and degrees and experience that qualifies them to care for this child. What was my qualification to take that child home and to care for it? All I had to have was a car seat. Like, isn't that crazy? I didn't have to take a class. I didn't have to read a book. All of a sudden, I'm responsible for this beautiful little girl. And I remember as I strapped my little purple alien looking baby into the car seat, just the weight of my not enoughness weighing down on me. Have you ever felt like you're just not enough? right? Maybe you're not a parent. Maybe it's every time you go on social media and you see the lives of other people, their perfect smiles or their perfect children or their wonderful vacations or their beautiful cars and houses. And you compare your life and you say, I'm not enough. Or maybe it's at school, right? And, and your grades reflect, you're not enough. So you try really hard, but you can never be enough. Or maybe it's in relationships with others where you're too much this or you're not enough that. And so you've been rejected by family or friends, people you love because you're not enough. The message of we're not enough comes at us from all different spaces. And today we're going to come to the ancient text of Exodus. This has been a universal human problem forever. We're going to look at the story in Exodus of a man who knows what it's like to feel not enough. His name is Moses. And we're not looking at this story of Moses just to commiserate with him, but to see how God meets somebody who's not enough right in their inadequacies. So as we jump into the passage, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 4. I've titled the message, Not Enough, because Moses understood that about himself. And uh, before we jump in, though, I want us to have some context around uh, the, the, you know, where we've been so far in the story. So Moses is a Hebrew man who was saved from the genocide of Pharaoh. As Pharaoh was trying to kill off all the baby boys, he was saved, and ultimately he was raised and educated in Pharaoh's own household by Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses is a highly educated individual, understood the Egyptian language. And one day as he's grown up, he's 40 years old-ish, and he goes out and he sees the plight of his people who have been placed in slavery. Harsh burdens have been thrown on them. They have taskmasters that are um, harsh that have been placed over them. They're in difficult plight. This is real suffering. And he sees this and it inflames his sense of justice. And he gets angry and and he has the right passion, the right motivation. He wants God's people to be free, but it comes out with the wrong method. And so he kills one of these taskmasters as he sees the harsh treatment and his sin gets found out. And Moses runs from his sin to a place called Midian and spends 40 years running from his sin, building a whole new life, beginning, starting all over, trying to avoid the past mistakes that he made in Egypt. He marries a woman named Zipporah. They settle down and have a family. He lives with his father-in-law, Jethro, and he's tending to the flocks. Moses has left Egypt and the mistakes therein behind. And then in Exodus 3, God calls out to Moses and said, you're going back there. You know, the place where you made the worst mistake of your life, you're going back there. And I'm going to exhibit my power before you. And you're going to go to the elders of Israel and they're going to believe you. They're going to believe that God appeared to you. They will listen to you. And ultimately, this will be the sign. You will one day worship me on this mountain together as a people. And so all throughout Exodus 3, God kind of unpacks this plan that he has, this this calling that he has on Moses' life. And in Exodus 4, Moses has got some objections for God's plan. Let's jump into the text. 
Exodus 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. He's like, God, I got baggage in Egypt. Um, remember, I murdered somebody there. They're, no one's going to believe you appeared to me. No one's going to believe God appeared to a murderer. And what I think is so interesting, as Moses brings his inadequacy, he's like, God, I'm not the guy for the job. No one will believe me. Look at how God responds. Verse two, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? I think it's so interesting. God doesn't even address that insecurity that he just exhibited. God's, they're not gonna believe me. He doesn't address that, but he's about to meet him right in his inadequacy with power. And he says, what is that in your hand? Now, God's not asking this question because he's daft and, and he needs some sort of information that he didn't already have. I think he wants Moses very clear about what he's about to do. Moses has been in the desert a long time. He's been talking with sheep. I think he wants Moses very clear about the power that is going to uh, be shown here in a moment. So he says, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. Not an unusual request. I'm sure Moses has thrown tantrums in the wilderness before, throwing the stick on the ground. Although this time, something different happens. So he threw it on the ground. And it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. When I first read this story, I was like, gosh, what a baby. He runs from the snake. Like, come on, dude, man up. But if Moses is running, everybody should be running. Moses is the guy who's been tending to the flocks of Jethro. He's been tending to these sheep for a long time in the wilderness. He knows what animals are dangerous. And he looks at this snake that's most likely deadly. And he's like, I am out of here, God. Like, is this judgment for the murder finally? Or what what is going on? He starts running. And then as he's running away, verse four, but the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. What? What, God? Catch the snake by the tail? Like, I don't know, God, if you know much about snake handling. Uh, This is uh, in that moment, if I'm Moses, I'd be like, you don't grab a snake by the tail. That leaves their head freely available to chomp down on me and have some lunch. Like, you just don't do that. But Moses doesn't argue with him. The Lord said, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Moses reaches out, and and, and from an earthly perspective, this makes no sense. Moses, this is a deadly snake. He should die, but he doesn't. Because of his exhibiting faith-rooted obedience, he reaches out, grabs the snake, and it becomes a staff in his hand again. He experiences the power of God. Faith-rooted obedience does lead to a deeper experience of the power of God. And here he he is uh, seen before God. God. God's meeting him in his insecurity with his power. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Now, if I'm Moses in this moment and God says, put your hand inside your cloak, I'm going to be like, God, I just saw what you did with the snake. I don't want Medusa fingers. Can we not do any more stuff? Like, can we just have one sign? But Moses puts his hand inside of his cloak and then he pulls it out and it's leprous like snow. And leprosy is uh, is a real condition, and today there's a cure for it. But back then, this represented a real problem. He pulls out not just a health issue. This was uh, likely, I was reading a biblical archaeology uh, article just a couple days ago that talked about how, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but that leprosy was likely the 11th plague of Egypt. There was a pandemic of leprosy, and Egypt was throwing their best minds at this problem to try and solve it, find a cure. How are we going to stop the spread of leprosy? And so when Moses pulls his hands out, this doesn't just reflect a a health problem. He would have been ostracized. Nobody wants to be around somebody who has leprosy. But also, this is a picture of uncleanness. All through the scripture, leprosy shows uh, 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 it's a symbol of sin. And so even in Leviticus, there's specific laws about how to deal with leprosy. And so God causes him to have a leprous hand, and then he puts it back inside of his cloak. Verse seven, then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Now, God isn't just giving Moses a couple parlor tricks or or magic tricks to kind of coax people's faith along. God is revealing something of himself in these signs. Two things. 
Firstly, the snake. The snake rightly should have killed Moses. This was a, a symbol of what had the power of life and death. And Moses reaches out and grabs it and it becomes a staff again in his hand. God is saying, I am the God who has the power over life and death. Moses should have died by God's power. He did not. The second one, the sign of leprosy, as Egypt was throwing their best minds at this. This is a global superpower trying to figure out a pandemic problem. And God says, in an instant, I can heal it. I have the power to heal you. I have the power to take what is unclean and make it clean again. God is revealing something of his nature. These signs would have been very profound to the elders of Israel as Moses and Aaron exhibit them ultimately in, in a few verses we'll see. And then lastly, he gives them another sign. He says in verse eight, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter. And the, uh, they may believe the latter sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. This was the third sign, and it was a sign of judgment. And so God gives him these three powerful signs that reveal something about the character and nature of who God is. He meets Moses in his not enoughness, in his inadequacy, in his insecurity with power. He's saying, Moses, you're looking at yourself. Look to me. It's not about you. This mission I've called you to, it's not about you. Yes, you're inadequate, but I'm not. And so on the other side of seeing these three signs, you might think, man, Moses is probably, his faith has been bolstered and he's going to go. But that's not what happens. Verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who's made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Moses is still looking at himself. He says, God, the calling you have put on my life is impossible. I don't speak well. Some scholars translate this to the, there was some sort of speech impediment. But whatever the problem is, Moses is still looking at himself. And we know from Acts 7, his story. It kind of re recounts some of Moses' story. Acts 7 tells us that Moses was highly educated and he was powerful in speech. He was educated by the Egyptians. He knows how to handle Pharaoh's court. He knows the Egyptian language. He lived in Pharaoh's home in the palace. If there's anybody who's qualified to go before Pharaoh and be a representative of God, it's Moses. He has the passion for God's people to be free, but he still is looking at himself and saying, I can't do this. And God doesn't give him a pep talk and say, no, it's okay, buddy. Remember your history and... You, just don't forget what, where you've been and, and you, you, you can do this. God says, it's not about you, Moses. It's about me. Who made man's mouth? And ultimately he says, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Now go, obey. Remember that faith you just experienced picking up the snake and you saw power? Go and obey, you'll see more power. And Moses is wrestling with the call. He says, God, I'm not enough. And I think it's so easy to look at Moses in the story and say, come on, man. Like, get your stuff together. You're about to part the Red Sea. Okay, like, let's get over yourself. Because we know the story of Moses. But for Moses, this was terrifying. God's calling him to go back to the moment of one of his worst failures in his life. To stand before the most powerful man in the world and ask him to do something we know he doesn't want to do. This is a difficult call and a difficult wrestling. And what I love about God is he doesn't rebuke Moses for bringing his doubts, his inadequacy, his insecurity before him. We can bring all of ourselves before the Lord, even our doubts, even our worries, even our fears. God doesn't rebuke him. He meeting him right where he's at in his insecurity with the power of God. And so we've seen God meet him graciously and patiently all throughout the story, but we're about to see the tone of the conversation shift. Listen to this. Verse 13, but he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Moses' inadequacies have become his identity and he believes not even God can use me. I'm so inept, I'm so inadequate, I'm so not enough, not even God can use me. 
Verse 14, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Uh Uh-oh. Like, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want that to be a verse in reference to Jason. Like, the anger of the Lord is kindled. It's not a raging inferno, but God is angry with Moses. And even in his anger, look at his actions that come out of his anger. Often, when we exhibit anger, it, it comes from a place of selfishness or me getting what I want. It's often sinful. God's not. He's angry and look at the actions that come on the other side of his anger. Listen to this. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and tell you and will teach you what you should do. So he says, look, even in his anger, Moses says, God send someone else. Some translations say, God send anyone else. Moses said, anyone else. Even just choose one of the sheep, God. They'd be better than me. And, Mo- and God's anger is kindled towards Moses. But even in his anger, God graciously says, I'll send a helper with you. I'm gonna send Aaron, your brother. His heart's gonna be glad to see you. You guys will do this together. But he does say, ultimately, it's not about you and it's not about Aaron. Look at uh, the second part there of, Verse 15, I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and it shall be your mouth. You shall be as God to him and take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Moses is so focused on himself. He says, I can't do it. So God graciously meets him there, even in his anger and says, I'll send help. So ultimately, Moses decides to obey. Verse 18, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. He doesn't tell him the full story. I think Moses believes that if he was to tell anybody what God called him to do, they would think he's crazy because he believes he's so inadequate. What's he going to say? Yeah, I was in the wilderness and the desert and there's this bush that was burning and wasn't smoky though. So I went over to check it out, took my shoes off. The bush talked to me and told me I was going to go back. Like it just, it, it didn't, it sounds crazy. The call of God on Moses, he so has disqualified himself from the mission that God has that he doesn't even explain it to Jethro. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. So he, he's uprooted his whole life, that life that he created running from his sin. And he's going back right into the lap of Egypt, right into the lap of his biggest failure, back to that place of pain to serve God and God's people. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power but I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. What? Plot twist. Like, God, I thought you said we were going to do amazing signs and wonders. You're going to bring your people out with a mighty hand. And and God, I thought you said they will listen to me and this is going to go okay. And we're going to get on the mountain of God and worship you. Like, what are you talking about? You're going to harden his heart. Here's what I think we need to hear from this. When God calls us, to um, the mission he has on our life, the calling for our lives, it's not always up and to the right. God is in control here and he's going to get glory over Pharaoh ultimately by hardening his heart. And millions of people in Egypt will see the power and glory of God displayed because he hardens Pharaoh's heart. And I highly encourage you, this is often a sticking point verse for a lot of people. We don't have the time to do the deep dive on what this means, the sovereignty of God and free will and how that all teases out. I highly encourage you, go do some study on this passage. Go, uh, uh, go in your study Bible, or if you need to talk to someone, uh, a trusted friend that you know uh, understands the word, do some research on this, do some work on this, because we don't have the time to dig into it fully. But God says, I will harden his heart. I think Moses in this moment thought, this is up and to the right from here on, man. I've got the signs. I've got uh, God's power is with me and for me. We're gonna lead these people out. Didn't go as Moses had planned. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel's my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. This is such relational language here. God, this shows God's father heart. 
Like he's so about relationship. This is the overarch in scripture. God is a God who desires relationship with his people. He doesn't say, let my people go. He doesn't say, let my subjects go. He says, let my son go. God takes the freedom of his children very seriously. He did in Egypt and he does today. He, he takes it so seriously that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die that you and I might receive freedom from sin. So he says, let my son go. If not, I will do to your people what you've done to mine. I will kill your firstborn son. And now we're going to get into, I'm going to be honest, this is a weird verse, okay? So just hang with me for a moment. Verse 24, at a lodging place along the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Yikes, okay? Like he's kindled God's anger. Now God wants to put him to death. Like I don't want to be Moses in this moment. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. I don't think that's a term of endearment. So he let him alone. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So this is a funky moment. And here's what we know from the text. Firstly, Moses, uh, the Lord sought to kill him. Second, what caused God to relent was the circumcision of their child. And so here's what many scholars and commentators are in agreement on how to interpret this passage. God is about to use Moses as a national leader of his people to the promises and the covenant of God, right? He, Moses is going to be a, a leader of, of the people to inherit the promises of God in the covenant, but he's not obeying it in his own household. The sign of the covenant was circumcision. And for whatever reason, his son was not circumcised. And so God takes his covenant and his promises so seriously that he was seeking to put Moses to death. He wants leaders to be authentic, where they should not proclaim one thing to a people and then not exhibit it themselves. He was going to lead the nation of Israel into the promises, but he wasn't obeying the sign of the covenant in his own household. And so God seeks to put him to death. And most scholars will say this was probably some sort of sickness. And then Zipporah had some sort of revelation that, that they needed to circumcise their son. And so God relents. Verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered all the elders of the people of Israel. This is faith-rooted obedience right here. All of the objections Moses has had, God listened to. And now Moses, with his brother Aaron, is obeying. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their head and worshiped. This is the power of God on display. Moses and Aaron obey. They say everything that God has told them to say. They do the signs that God has given them. And the elders of Israel believe, contrary to everything Moses thought was going to happen. They believe and they worship. They're prostrate on the ground, bowing down to the Lord, just worshiping God as they've experienced the God who sees them. God is not far off. He sees them in their plight, in their suffering, and in their slavery. And so I just want to comb back through the passage. And here's the one thing I want us to take away today. God is powerful. Look, Moses keeps saying, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. That's okay because God is powerful. If we want to be people who experience the power of God, we need to be okay, firstly, bringing all of ourselves before the Lord, just like Moses does, our insecurities, our fears, our worries. But ultimately, on the other side of that, when God calls us to a mission, it requires obedience. Experiencing God's power requires faith-rooted obedience. Faith-rooted obedience leads to a deeper experience of God's power. Look at it in the passage. Moses keeps looking at himself. God, I can't do this. Who's he focused on? Me, my, his eyes are on himself. When our eyes are on ourselves, we're not going to experience the power of God because we're looking at ourselves and there's not any power here. So he's looking at himself and, and God says, what is that in your hand? He throws the staff on the ground and it becomes a serpent. Power of God. Moses starts running from the power of God. God calls him back and says, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. 
faith-rooted obedience. So he put out his hand, caught it by the tail. And what happened? It became a staff in his hand. He experiences the power of God. Faith-rooted obedience is required to experience the power of God, right? And ultimately, he sees this sign, but he continues to argue with God. He's like, even though you've done this amazing thing, God, I'm not your guy. Send anybody else. Ultimately, after all the wrestling is done, he obeys God. And he goes with his brother Aaron, and they spoke all the words, and they did all the signs. And what happened? Power of God. The people believed and they bowed their heads in worship to the God who sees them in the midst of their plight, to the God of their promises, to the God of their fathers. They see that God is there and is for them because of Moses's faith-rooted obedience. This had to have been such an encouraging moment to Moses. Like, God, I thought you can't use me and, and I, I was concerned. Like, But look at what happened. God used him and Aaron. They go in obedience as God has graciously and patiently met them in their faith wrestle, or Moses in particular. And what happened? Power of God. The people believed and they worshiped as a result of that. If we want to be people who experience the power of God in our lives, it requires faith-rooted obedience. So here's kind of a statement I want us to use to evaluate To experience the power of God, go back to the last time you told him no and say yes. What was the last time you told God no? Look, it's okay to wrestle. Moses wrestled. Jesus wrestled in the garden. He says, God, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Moses' wrestling led to willful disobedience for a season. Jesus' wrestling led to surrender. It's okay to wrestle. It's where does that wrestling lead you that matters? Is it apathy and inaction? Or is it faith-rooted obedience? What was the last time you told God no? We're coming up on three years of my wife and I. Three years ago, we were wrestling. Do we come down to South Umpqua? I have had some holy discontent in me about what what the future of ministry would be. I didn't feel as passionate about what I was currently doing. And and uh, the conversation about moving to South Umpqua campus came up and I was wrestling with that. Like, what does that mean? And God, I've got all kinds of reasons to disqualify myself. I had I pulled a total Moses. I could give you 10 reasons why I shouldn't be a campus pastor, right? I'm looking at myself and my inadequacies and my not enoughness. And there was no sin issues, but it's just, I don't see that I could do this, God. And I remember talking to Pastor Ed ad nauseum about my inadequacies. And he would continually point me back, firstly, to where God had prepared me for this in my story. And second, to it's not about you, Jason. This is about God. This is his mission. This is his church. And he will see it through if he's called you to it. And during that season, I got a phone call from a staff member and they didn't even know what I was wrestling with. But the content of that call made it very clear. We're supposed to go. I'm supposed to exhibit faith-rooted obedience. And so we went. <laughs> Much to uh, my, my chagrin, we went. And it has been amazing to see what God has done in the community of people in South Umpqua. Parents discipling their kids husbands and wives growing in relationship together, Uh, families worshiping God together, people living on mission, people that uh, society would discard that are living on mission and and, and, and sharing the gospel. This This has been a real experience of the power of God. If we want to experience God's power, it requires faith rooted obedience. So go back to that last time. It's okay to wrestle before him. And tell them yes. The next thing that I want us to see is, is experiencing God's power requires a, com- a community focused on God's power instead of their own weaknesses. I want you to see this in the passage. So Moses, he's arguing with God and he's looking at himself again. He's like staring straight in the mirror. And he says, I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and tongue. He says, God, look at me. I don't have what it takes. And what does God say? He says, it's not about you, Moses. I will be with your mouth. 
and teach you what you should speak. It's about me. I will be with you. I think we need more people in Christian community who do for each other what God does for Moses right here. Far too often in Christian community, we, we give each other trite phrases. When we're struggling with our calling, right? Maybe there's a passion that you have that God has placed in your life, but you think, I don't have the resources. I don't have the time. I don't have the talents. I don't have the ability. I don't have, we have all kinds of excuses. It's very easy to pull a Moses. And what I have seen in Christian community is people saying, you know what, you're right. That's really hard. I'm sorry. You know, that makes sense. And we kind of coddle each other into disobeying the call of God. We are universally called to make disciples. And our inadequacy, spiritually speaking, is no excuse to not live out that calling. And so here, Moses, God doesn't tell Moses, you know what, Moses, I get your, your concerns. But remember, buddy, you were really powerful in Egypt and you know the language. And so you're the guy for the job. Or he doesn't commiserate with him and magnify his weaknesses. He says, stop looking at yourself. Look at me. If we want to be people who help each other experience the power of God, we need to stop having people look at themselves and instead help them have the sight adjustment up to God. Because it's not about us. It's not about you. What if our conversations around uh, uh, people wrestling with their calling, when they say, man, I'm not enough. I can't make disciples. I don't know enough Bible. I don't know enough theology. I haven't read the whole Bible. I only understand the gospel. What if we said, you're right. You're not enough. And that's okay because God is enough. And it's God's power that enables us to live out these missions anyways. God always calls his people to what's impossible for them to do by themselves. That's always been true. Moses couldn't have done this by himself. The power of God exhibited through his faith-rooted obedience is what ultimately causes all of this, the fruit of Moses' ministry. It's not anything in Moses. What if instead of coddling each other um, when we're wrestling with the calling of God and saying, yeah, it's okay, don't worry about it. You don't have to, I know it's hard to share the gospel at work because there's restrictions or, or whatever it is. What if we said, yeah, but God's bigger. I know there's inadequacy in you. There's inadequacy in me, but God's bigger. What if we were a community that magnified God over our weaknesses, a community focused on God's power instead of our own weaknesses? Because God is powerful. We're talking about the God who created everything from nothing. We're talking about the God who we'll see here in a few short weeks parts the Red Sea. We're talking about the God of the 10 plagues of Egypt. We're talking about the God who who overcame death and our greatest enemy, sin and Satan, a very powerful enemy. He overcame all of that. Our God is powerful. And so we got to stop looking at ourselves. And we need to be a people who point each other back up to God. We need a sight adjustment. Moses needed a sight adjustment. God kept saying, don't look at you, look at me, buddy. What if we were a community that did that? How, we might, how might we experience God's power as we walk together, hand in hand, gazing at our king in faith-rooted obedience? I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. I'm praying for you. God bless. Thanks for sticking around. I appreciate you hanging out with me today. And I really just want to challenge our hearts as we've heard from God's word. Um, there's two challenges I want, I want us to evaluate. One of them we, we touched on in the message, but it's where are you tell, telling God no in your life right now? Maybe there's some sin he's calling you to repent of. Where are you telling him no? Maybe there's a calling he has on your life. Where are you telling him no? Maybe there's a place where you need to go and reconcile with somebody. Where are you telling God no? I encourage you today, find 10 minutes where you can pray before the Lord, just alone, just you and God, and evaluate this question before you. Because it may not immediately come to your mind. Maybe it did, and praise God for that. But if it didn't, take 10 minutes and evaluate before God. God, where where am I not listening? Where am I not walking in faith-rooted obedience. And then the second question I want you to evaluate 
is when have you experienced the power of God? As we look back on our story with Jesus, and we see those moments where we've experienced the power of God in our lives, the power of the gospel, it can be so encouraging for our faith as we move forward in faith-rooted obedience, even when it doesn't look like it makes sense. So I want you to evaluate these questions, and I'd highly encourage you, share them with your spouse, share them with a trusted friend, bring your community into your wrestling with you. I know that can feel scary, but it's how we're designed. So bring them in on this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are a God who allows your people to wrestle. And, and thank you just for dealing with the audacity of Moses to question your call. And God, we, we all do that. Um, I know I do. Father, I pray that as we wrestle with what you've called us to do, the universal calling to make disciples and the, our unique callings, the calling, the specific reason you've placed us here, I pray that you would help us to say, yes, God, as we wrestle forward with you. In Jesus' name, amen.